Okay. Uh, so today we're going to formulate the nonlinear equation in optical fiber, and of course we're just going to do uh, most of the simple stuff. And there's actually a book called Nonlinear. I think there's a book called Nonlinear Fiber Optics. Okay, so it's a 900-page book. Okay, so apparently uh, we're not going to touch those. Um, so <clears throat> last time we learned that by doing a Fourier transform, we can kind of simplify the um, current nonlinearity okay, into this very simple equation where the refraction index at a certain time depends on the intensity of light at that exact moment. And we raise a question, okay, since fiber tele telecommunication is the backbone of you know, most of the uh, internet today, okay, the question is if you send an input light at one end of fiber, and what would be the output port waveform look like? Okay, and in it there is dispersion. Okay, we said that there's dispersion, there's nonlinearity. And um, so we're going to um, write down an equation that includes these two dominant effect and uh, also give you guys a solution. Okay, and last time we also said that the way that we um, kind of want this to work is to treat this um, refraction index change because of curl effect as a perturbation. Okay, it's very small, so that we can actually add it um, in the end when we need to calculate when we need to plug in the refraction index. Okay, so we're not going to start from the uh, our usual um, our usual uh, nonlinear optics equation. Okay. So uh, where we're going to start? Okay, the starting point here is that first, okay, regarding the wave, electrical wave, uh, the light. Um, so here we're going to calculate okay, both the um, x, y, z components and then time. Right? So this is not a plane wave anymore. You can't make that plane wave assumption anymore because obviously okay, the fiber is a confined structure so that we need to consider x, y, z, t. And um, the equation that we're going to use, we're going to start with, apparently for most optical system is the uh, Maxwell equation. So we know that the Maxwell equation, at least for you know, a certain frequency omega, uh, we have this relationship where a changing magnetic field at frequency omega give rise to an electrical field at frequency omega. And also you will have the reverse. And here, okay, pay attention is that the curl effect is hidden here in the relative permittivity, right? Because relative permittivity gives you a refraction index. Okay. So it's hidden there at some point when it's you know when when we when we, when we think it's necessary, we will treat this as a perturbation and insert it in here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> And what about dispersion? Where dispersion is hidden? Dispersion is hidden at this fact, right? So R omega t. And the omega components means that the refraction index depends on your frequency or depends on your wavelength. Okay, that's where the uh, frequency components came from. Okay, and then um, And then the uh, and then t okay come from the um, curl effect. Right? So now the standard procedure okay when you see this um, I think we did this in EM field and also we did this in the first few lectures in this class is that you do you do a cross a curl okay on the first equation. which will give you this. 
okay and then the curl of B okay you can plug in here and this will give you eventually give you um, why do I have a tilt on top it's a, okay so I think here I use a tilt to represent that it's in frequency domain okay so you plug in here and then what you will get is minus mu epsilon epsilon r And then here, because we know that, okay, we know that this is in omega, is, this is in frequency domain, okay, so you can write it down as E, X, Y, Z, omega, okay. The um, propagation constant, right, the uh, Z components is hidden here. And um, <clears throat> so when you look at this, and then you plug it back in, this equal to uh, mu knob. So now omega square, so r. Okay, and the second thing that we can simplify is this double curl, right? I think this you guys also see before. Okay. And then we always assume that by using the, um, um, by assuming the uh, Gaussian law, okay, um, this the divergence of E okay it's always zero so by assuming that we get the equation that look like this let me put it down here Okay, so nothing, nothing new, okay, nothing new. Um, <clears throat> one thing we kind of have to, we can be a little bit uh, careful, or we can, well, we can make the assumption is that uh, where, while the light when you send into the fiber, we can say that, we can assume that the frequency range is relatively small, the span, okay. So the spectrum is relatively narrow, so that what you can do is that you can, Is that whatever a, a function, let's say it's depend on omega, you can always do a Taylor expansion around the spectrum envelope center, right? So you can do it as um, f naught plus f1 times omega. So this is just to uh, easily simplify um, our calculation. And then this will apply when we consider dispersion, right? Your refraction index is a function of wavelength, okay? And then after this, after this, apparently something that we need to calculate is this. Right? And this is a second order derivative, which is not very easy and we can assume we can assume a certain form of your electrical wave okay and when you look at this um, when you look at this um, differential equation the first thing you kind of realize is that you can do what you can do is that you can do um, separation of variable Okay, that's a very standard way to uh, process 
the process the um, differential equation so that the separation of variable we write down here. Okay, let's say omega minus omega naught, right? Is that xy is the cross section, okay? Cross section of this fiber, z is the propagation direction, okay? So there's a mode distribution around, you know, at the cross section of the fiber, which you can kind of imagine that at the center of the fiber, the light will be most intense. And then when they spread out, okay, outside the fiber, the light intensity is almost zero, right? So that one, okay, will be described by this f function. And then you have, your waveform, well, your electrical field intensity, that depends on where your light has propagated to, right? If you have nonlinear effect or if you have absorption, this would uh, make a contribution. And then also, of course, uh, depend on your um, frequency, right? And then, of course, we know that when light propagate, there's a propagation factor, right? There's propagation constant or a phase term. And then here, usually we write it down as I, K, Z, okay? Here we write it down as I, beta naught, Z, okay? And you might wonder, okay, uh, in the past, we know that if you write down as I, K, Z, okay, K is actually omega divided by C, right? K, is de K depends on frequency. So the question, okay, there are two ways that we can, we can handle this. One is that you can assume, okay, beta, beta depends on frequency, omega, right? So when you solve it, you, you okay, you doesn't treat it as constant, but the variable. Um, the second th way to do it is that, okay, this beta z term can be absorbed in here a, right? Because we, a is a function of z and omega, right? So it's very natural if you assume beta knob is a constant, then the beta term, okay, that correspond to, well, that's related to frequency will show up here, right? So, um, <clears throat> so either way, okay, this equation is complete, okay, regarding describing the propagation constant, okay? And um, also we know that this, you know, delta square, okay, equal to this. Okay, equal to this. So now we plug in, plug in delta square and then E here, okay, E here into this equation and then let's see what we can get. And apparently one thing you will notice is that, okay, there's two derivatives that's about X and Y, it should follow f, right, the function f, because f is a function of x and y. And then z should, you know, mainly contribute to this term, okay, here. So what you end up getting is that first it's the differential on x and y, okay, on the f function, and then multiply the function about z okay and then it's the it's the um, derivative of z okay on the function that's related to z And eventually we have this uh, constant term, okay, constant term. And also in order to not carry everything around here, um, I think you guys know that the, um, let's see here, mu knob, epsilon knob equal to one C square, okay, and then omega divided by C is K, is K, okay, so, um,
Let's see. Okay, so let's use. Uh, okay, yeah. So the meaning here. Okay, let's define k naught. What k naught means? Okay, it's very simple. Omega divided by c. Okay, omega divided by c. It doesn't. It, it's not a function. Well, it's not a constant, but it's a function of omega. Okay. So this term omega squared divided by c squared will be k naught squared. Right. So. So what you will have here is you will have right at permittivity k naught square f okay. okay and the reason that okay we assume a k knob and then here we assume beta knob. Okay, the reason we do this is because, well, the reason that they two are not equal to each other is because if you think about it, um, previously we assumed plane wave, okay? But now there's a fiber confining the light, and inside the fiber you have refraction index of, well, let's say N1. Outside the fiber you have refraction index of N2, okay? And we know that the uh, K, Previously, in plane wave definition, we have this, right? So before solving this equation, you actually don't know what is the actual k, right? What is the actual uh, uh, wave vector, right? Because it really depends on the, the well, the, the, the effective n, right? The effective refraction index. It's an average between n1 and n2 by certain way, okay? We have because we don't know that yet, so we say, okay, it's beta knob, okay? Beta knob with unknown refraction index, effective refraction index in the equation. Now, uh, this equation now become quite obvious how to solve. Um, so by using, what you, you should do is that you should divide down this equation by, let's see, yeah. So um, first, you should divide down this equation. Okay, whenever you, you do separation of variable, what you can do is say you divide down the equation, let's say equation one, okay, by E itself, right? So divide down by F, X, Y, A, And what this would turn your equation into, if you pay a close attention, okay, this term a e i beta cancel a e i beta, right? So the first term become okay, the differential of x and y on f divided by f. Now, I think we've mentioned this before, okay? You have to first do the differential and then do the division. So these two, you can't cancel them, okay? And the second term, the second term, the F term cancel with this F term, right? So that you have A, okay. Okay, this whole thing divided by um, a okay again here is the same idea that you have to first do the differential on z and then divide it by this okay so they don't they don't cancel okay and then the third term here uh, when you divide this down the f cancel each other so you have epsilon uh, omega Okay, and this one, okay, this one, they do cancel each other because this is just the, this is just the um, electrical field, right? So what you have end up here, epsilon r k naught square.
okay, equal to zero. Okay. C. Yeah, I think this this is correct. Okay. And um, <clears throat> and if you're familiar with separation of variable, okay, here you you already know okay what you need to do. Okay. Um, if you look at this, this the first term is a function of x and y, right? You can write down the first term as f x y. Okay. The second term is a function of z, right? And the third term is a constant. It's a constant on omega, right? And the sum of them is zero. So it's apparent, okay, that the function of f, the function f and function g, they have to be a constant, right? If they're not a constant, then whenever you satisfy this equation, you change a little bit of x, then you no longer satisfy this equation, right? So this is, they all have to be constant, okay? And all these three constants, when they sum up together, give you a zero, okay? And then you get equation of x and y, you get equation of z, and then you solve them separately, okay? This is the meaning of separation of variable, okay? And let's see, I think we can erase here. We, well, we all know what fiber is. We don't need to keep this figure. And we have used Maxwell equation already. So get rid of it. Okay. So uh, before assigning, okay, before assigning a constant here, uh, we probably will want to do some simplification here. Okay. Uh, because after that, okay, the C1, C2, uh, the constant you assign, actually can have a little bit of physical meaning, which will simplify the, um, you know, the overall equation by a bit, okay? So this part, okay, this part, there's nothing you can simplify because we know nothing about f, and this part is just a constant. You don't have to simplify it with anything, okay? So we look at this, okay? So this specific term, um, okay, I think we kind of solve it before, um, in standard nonlinear optical equation, and what you can write down here is okay. Let's see, there's a All right. So when you do this differential, you have to do it up on both a and z, right? So you get. Um, a few terms which I will just write it down here, okay? You can look at note page 26 um, if you want step by step. Okay, the first one of course is uh, both of the differential is on A, okay? And then yeah, E, I, beta, naught, Z, okay? The second one is of course both of the differential is on the uh, face term. All right, so it'll come out, beta will come out twice, so minus beta naught square, okay, and then A, okay. And then the third term is, of course, you do a differential A once, and then you do differential uh, exponential, or not, um, you do each once, right? And then you will end up with two of these terms. So it's two I beta knob, okay? Okay. And um, I think we all remember that we use slow varying <laughs> Uh, slow varying uh, amplitude approximation before, right? Saying that the amplitude change of A on Z is much, much smaller than the, than the variation of a waveform, 
right? That, then the variation of a wavelength. So this, this has to make sense in fiber telecommunication is because if your waveform change rapidly, then there's really no information can be transmitted, right? You distort the waveform. So um, here, we would just apply the slow uh, varying amplitude approximation, okay, saying that the second derivative of A is much, much smaller than the beta term, okay, and the first derivative of A, okay, slow varying uh, amplitude approximation. So we get rid of this term, okay, we get rid of this term. Okay, now uh, when we come back here, okay, when we come back here, what we see is that this term, okay, this term when you divide it by your function itself, a exponential i beta naught z, okay, is just another constant beta naught square. Right, it's just another function. Okay, so let's let's see, let's use here. So the equation you end up with, okay, if you simplify this term here, is okay partial partial x. And then plus, okay, so uh, this term, okay, divided by, this term divided by here, give you a minus beta square, okay, minus beta square. And then this term, okay, here is plus r omega, K naught square, okay, and the definition of K naught is omega divided by C, okay. And then, um, and if you see, okay, if this is plane wave, if this is plane wave, then these two will be equal to each other, okay, and you cancel this term. And then the final one is this term, sorry, uh, this term, yes, 2i beta naught, this term, and then when you divide it by this, the uh, phase term cancel each other, and then you end up with 2i beta naught, okay, partial a, partial z, z omega. So this is the equation you get, right? And, okay, let's see, erase all this. Okay, now we can assign uh, functions here. We can assign functions here. So we can assign constant here. So when we look at this, okay, the important thing that we notice, okay, we notice is that um, is that really how much, okay, it's really how much the beta, okay, deviate from the plane wave, right? If it's a plane wave, then these two equal to each other and this term is zero. And if the wave just propagates, there's no nonlinear effect, this term is also zero, right? The um, change of amplitude over z is zero, okay? So <clears throat> the way that um, you can assign, the way that you assign this constant will look like this. equal to OK. 
Okay, so you, you might wonder what, what this is, right? What this is, is that the constant, right, this is a constant, and the meaning of it is quite clear, okay, we're trying to solve a, a new wave vector, okay, so this is actually your, kind of your free parameter, the constant that you usually assign in um, separation of variable. But the fact that this constant minus this, okay, make a lot of sense is because if this is truly a plane wave, okay, if there's no fiber, then this beta tilt should equal to this um, should equal to this plane wave equation, and this term should vanish to zero. Okay, so this is just to um, make sure that whenever, um, well, in another word, is that now because it's in a fiber, okay, so this beta tilt should deviate, okay, from this plane wave solution. Okay, so uh, this is just to make sure that in the, uh, in the future we, when we do we can do Taylor expansion of beta around here, and then you can cancel out certain terms, okay? And, um, <clears throat> and once you have this, you can use uh, boundary condition, okay, on the uh, fiber, you know, cross section. Okay, there's a cross section. Uh, the boundary condition would be, I think in this term would be um, at, y you, well, So instead of x and y, when you really solve this, you should convert to a polar coordinate, and then your boundary condition should be at zero at the center, okay, your solution is finite, and then at infinite, away from the fiber, your solution is zero. Right? So you have two uh, boundary condition, okay, to try to get this beta here. Now, if this is this number, okay, then we can plug this back in here, and what we will get is that we will get, okay, this equation we will get is beta square minus, okay, and minus beta square plus, okay, So see that by introducing um, epsilon r k naught here, okay, one thing is that you can kind of have a uh, uh, physical meaning of this term. The other benefit is that you can cancel out this in the second equation, okay? So that uh, instead of carrying the uh, dispersion epsilon r term in this equation, okay, you kind of, um, you know, put it into the um, equation of f, right? And these two are kind of equivalent. It doesn't really matter because like eventually when you solve it, okay? If you, if you keep this in this term, okay? And then when you solve the constant for this, okay? That constant always carry over to the f here, right? Because the constant of this plus constant of this is zero, right? So these two equations are connected anyway, okay? So this is just a mathematical you know, convenience, it doesn't really uh, simplify, the uh, simplify the physics, okay? So um, what we can do is that we can write down the equation, summarize the equation here that you will have is 2i beta naught partial a partial z plus beta square, okay? Uh, in note page 27, I, oh, okay, I have beta squared here, okay. Okay, um, just recall what's beta naught, the definition of beta naught. Okay, you guys, um, let's see. We should probably put it somewhere, okay. The definition of beta naught, oh, okay, it's, uh, it's here. This is zero, and then you also have uh, 
f x y okay equal to okay so you get two set of equation and then what you have successively do is that you separate x and y okay you separate x and y So now, <clears throat> now what we can do next to solve this equation, it's kind of, you know, the, 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 so, you know, the solving of this equation is kind of, um, will be a mess if we really try to solve it uh, analytically. But um, what you can kind of try to uh, get a sense of here is uh, this equation gives you the cross-section distribution of your mode, okay, that's your fiber mode. And um, it's not gonna change, okay, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, right, of the fiber, okay, just, uh, it's the same piece of fiber so that this F function should stay the same, okay, on the left and on the right. So that whatever we solve, our goal is to get this beta. And then we plug that beta back into here and that's a critical part is because we can now solve A, right? A is the amplitude of the light, right? At frequency omega. So this is a goal, this is the equation that's equivalent to our nonlinear optical equation, okay? And this is just the distribution that solved the beta, okay? So, um, <clears throat> so now we can, um, well, so the, the, the strategy, okay, we're going to do this is that we're going to use something called a perturbation theory. Perturbation theory. They assume that the nonlinear effect is very weak. Okay, it's a small number. We also assume that the dispersion is very weak. Okay, and these are valid assumptions once you check the numbers in the fiber. Okay, and uh, to do this, what we would do is okay, we would expand epsilon r. Okay, epsilon r we know by definition is. Okay, epsilon r by definition is n r square, right? Refraction index square. Okay, and equal to n omega plus delta n square. Okay, so here the definition is like this. This n omega, okay, refraction index depend on the frequency of light. This one characterize the dispersion. Of your fiber, okay, and delta n here is the nonlinear contribution, okay. The Kerr effect, this part, this is delta n, okay, and then we can assume that delta n is much much smaller than n omega, right? And I think we calculate this once the the number is very small, okay. So. Um, then, okay, this is approximate to, okay, we use the um, Taylor expansion on delta n, then you have n omega square plus two delta n, n omega, okay? Okay, then we can also do the same, okay? If you look at this equation, right? Uh, epsilon r is here. Beta not is here. Beta is here, right? So if you kind of do this small perturbation on this term, you can also do the perturbation on this term using exactly the same assumption. Okay. So the assumption here we're going to make is beta also has two contribution term. One, okay, is coming from the dispersion, right? Beta omega. It's exactly the same as n omega, and the second term we call it delta beta omega. Okay, we'll keep the omega here just, just in case, right? And this term is a high order term that comes from nonlinear effect, right, from Curry effect. Okay. 
Let me double check. Okay. I think I'm correct here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's from the contribution from the nonlinear guy. Okay. So this way you kind of draw the um, you know the terms are kind of correspond to each other, okay, in this equation, okay, when you solve it. Now <clears throat> Now, uh, whenever you do perturbation theory, okay, then something you do, okay, is that you plug in all this back into this equation, and then you try to, um, and then you try to collect the terms that correspond to each other, right? Correspond to the same order, and um, to do this, okay, to do this, what you would do is that. Okay, to do this, what you would do is you can um, <clears throat> also expand your f, x, y into, for example, first order, uh, second order, etc. And then, you know, plug in everything. f is, you know, perturbation expanded. All this coefficient is perturbation expanded. And then you know this is large, this is small, this is large, this is small, right? And then you collect all the large term into the first order equation. And then the first order equation will be quite straightforward. That's this. Okay. Um, F, Y, X, Y. Right, so you see that, okay, it's, uh, you know, all this N and beta, okay, are from the uh, first order term. That's a large one, okay, coming down here. And this equation, okay, it's difficult to solve, uh, but then there's actually, uh, if you adapt to a polar coordinate, there is analytical solution, you know, special function. And then you can look up in the uh, textbook, and then also you just Google search, right? Fiber mode, and then it will show up, okay? And so uh, by doing this, by doing this, um, By doing this, I think this equation, okay. Let's let's move on to second order. Second order is uh, when you collect all these other terms, okay. You collect all these other terms and then it's at the at the uh, bottom of page 28. And it will give you 2n omega k naught square delta n omega, okay. And then minus 2 beta Omega, okay, delta beta, omega, F1, okay, and uh, where this term come from is coming from the square, okay, when you try to square these terms, um, you will create two beta times delta beta term, okay, that's kind of usual, and then K naught square, okay, you times this term here, Okay, this term here, okay, is what you get. Okay, now we make uh, a further uh, approximation. A further approximation is what, is what delta um, beta is, right, what delta beta is. 
Okay. Um, what delta beta is, you can, what you can do is that uh, beta omega, okay, if you assume, well, this is just, let me not do this here. Let's justify, okay, what we can, how we can simplify data, data beta, right? So if we look at what beta is, right? Beta is, what beta is, is uh, beta is actually the, uh, beta is actually the effective K, right? If you look at here, effective K vector, right? So um, the first order or the zero order assumption, okay, assuming it's plane wave, then this will be, beta omega, okay, will be n omega k naught, right? This will be, okay, this is what beta omega is, right? k naught is omega divided by c, so n omega divided by c, that's the uh, first order assumption, right? And now if you assume, okay, what delta beta omega naught is, right, you can kind of instantly note, know, right, the Refraction index change caused by caused by your nonlinear effect is delta n, right? Delta n, and this delta n, okay, multiply with here, substitute here will give you k naught. Okay, so this is like if you want the zero order assumption, right? This is what your curl effect change your refraction index, okay? And then multiply your omega divided by C, that's how much it will change your uh, propagation constant. Um, the same apply to, okay, if you assume, okay, this is a plane wave. So this is kind of a plane wave assumption, okay? Plane wave assumption. And, um, let's see here. Okay, so if you don't use non-plane, if you don't use plane wave assumption, then what you can get is you can directly, you know, solve this equation here, right? This thing times f x y equal to zero, right? So the coefficient in the front must be zero, right? So if you do that, then your delta beta omega, okay, we're solving delta beta because beta eventually go back to this equation, right? So the target of this equation is that we try to solve beta. Right. So delta beta is part of beta. Right. Okay. Delta beta is, you know, going through this, n omega k naught square divided by beta omega delta n. Right. So it's, it's very similar to what you have seen here. The only difference is that you replace k knob with this, okay? What this is, is that, okay, the effective uh, wave vector, okay? Because it's not assuming plane wave anymore, right? So that's the only difference here. And this beta omega, you have to solve it from here, okay? You have to solve it from here, okay? When you so we solve this equation, you get beta omega, and then you plug in here, you get the corrected uh, delta beta, okay? That's not a plane wave, that's not using plane wave assumption, okay? And, see what else we can erase, we can erase here. Let's see, probably we want to move a little bit quicker to just to get to the final equation. Um, I have a feeling that none of us will remember this derivation okay, after a few days. Okay. So, um, in page 29, okay, in page 29, it actually tells you exactly um, how to solve delta omega in a, in, a, uh, in a formal way, okay, in a formal way. Okay. There's actually a huge integration equation there, okay. So, um, you know, by doing all this, by solving this equation, what you get, what you get, is that you get, um, what you get is that you get um, beta omega, 
okay. And then you also get delta beta omega. Okay, this is from dispersion. This is from a nonlinear effect, current nonlinear effect. Okay, this is what you will get from this equation by solving by using boundary condition and solve this beta. Right. Okay. Okay. Then what you can do now is to plug these two back into here, right? Back into the first equation that we uh, want to solve in the first place. So, um, <clears throat> so what this equation, okay, when you write it down to I beta knob partial A partial Z plus beta square minus beta knob square, okay, A. Right. And then, we know that what beta omega is, right? What, what beta is, right? Beta, um, let's see. So the assumption we're going to use here, okay, is beta, okay? Beta is only deviates slightly from beta naught. Let's see, I don't have a tilt, okay, I don't have a tilt here, right? So because the curl effect and the dispersion effect, they are all um, small deviation from your original, let's say from your original solution, right? So beta tilt is only slightly different from beta naught, right? So what you can write down here is that uh, beta minus beta naught is small, okay? Or the other way you can write down is this, the, the difference, okay, is much, much smaller than one, okay? So then you can make approximation to this term now, beta knob plus okay, times beta tilt minus beta knob, okay? This is exactly this term, right? There's no approximation yet. And when you, okay, and when you look at this term, okay, what it is, is that beta zero plus beta zero plus their difference, right? And if we assume that their difference is very small, then this term can actually approximate to, this term can approximate to two beta naught, right? Plus. So we're throwing away the difference, okay, in this large term, which wouldn't matter that much, and then multiply a small term, okay? The difference is small, okay, small term. Okay, that's the approximation. Okay, so eventually what you will get now is an equation that's much, much simpler. As you can see the two beta knob Cancelled with two beta naught here, okay? That's actually the, the whole point of making this um, approximation. Then you will get, okay, partial A, partial Z, okay, equal to I, when you move this term to the right and then there's a minus sign you acquire and then you uh, move the I there and then the minus sign cancelled, okay? And this, you get beta, Okay, beta tilt, beta tilt we know, okay, beta tilt equal to, well, let's, let's write it down first, beta tilt minus uh, beta naught. Um, right, so this is the original equation. And we know that beta tilt, okay, beta tilt by definition is composed of beta omega plus delta beta omega. Right, that's our definition. You have a dispersion contribution, you have perturbation from nonlinear effect. Right. So what you can do here is that you can decompose this into beta knob, but uh, beta omega, okay, and then delta beta omega. Right. A. Okay, and then here you have beta zero. Right. So that you 
you now have an equation okay, that are expressed by the, um, by the function that you actually know what it is. Right? You know what beta omega is by solving this equation. Okay, we don't know it now okay, unless you really solve it. And then we know this, which is also get by solving this equation. Okay? And okay. Now this equation so far is still not solvable. Okay, if you if you recall, we haven't done any Fourier transform, so this equation is still in a frequency domain, right? Still in frequency domain. And then if you really expand this, you would see, okay, then this has a time component, and then time components you have to do uh, Fourier transform to that frequency domain, and then every term is com uh, you know uh, convolute again together. So. To simplify this, okay, we need to make these terms easy to do Fourier transform. Okay, then we do the whole Fourier transform on this entire equation, and then you get a time domain um, equation of fibers. Okay, so the way to do that, okay, is that we first, okay, we know that this is uh, a fiber. Well, we know that this is uh, determined by dispersion, so that we can do a Taylor expansion. Okay, let's say omega knob is the center frequency of your light envelope, right? And then you do a Taylor expansion, that would be beta knob plus, okay. Okay, and then by definition, People call this okay beta knob plus beta one delta omega plus beta two delta omega square. Right. So the first differential of beta over omega is usually called beta one. Okay. The second order differential of beta over omega is usually called beta two. Okay. This is called second order dispersion. This is called first order dispersion. If you look at it, it's the wave vector depend on omega. Wave vector is also n times omega divided by c, right? So this is also a dispersion on your. Um, well, let me let me put it this way. Okay. So if beta, if you look at usually beta is defined in this way, right? right if I give you a media, right? Okay. So. Naturally, if there's no dispersion at all, no dispersion at all, then you still have the first order differential, right? Because there's an omega here, right? There's omega here. So this term, so-called first order, you know, dispersion actually is not a dispersion. <laughs> okay, it's just simply okay, it's just simply the fact that your beta will naturally depend on omega. Right, because they're wave vector. So the, the term that actually gives you dispersion, okay, is actually the second term, beta two. Okay. So although it's called second order dispersion, but then when you look at uh, you know when you when you buy fiber, you look at the specification, it only gives you beta two. It never gives you beta one because beta one doesn't even, doesn't even matter. Okay. Um, okay. So this is um, how you can kind of simplify this. So uh, something that you do, okay, um, usually people do, is that this equation, okay, when we try to solve beta omega, right, dispersion, other than certain structure, for example, fiber, which has a, a you know, cylinder uh, symmetry that you can solve by hand, okay, using special function. For, for example, waveguide and then other structures um, that doesn't have this cylinder uh, symmetry, the, the way to do it is actually to use um, you know, numerical simulation. Okay? To plug in the numerical simulation, give the structure, and then nowadays, okay, these are quite commercialized, so you actually construct the um, equation itself, and then you hit run, okay? and then it will give you um, beta naught, beta two, okay? and then all those beta, okay? following the high order term. Okay? So, um, so you can kind of take it for granted, okay, that uh, for every optical structure, waveguide structure, or fiber structure, you, 
um, you can get this beta 2, you can get this dispersion, okay, through numerical calculation. Okay, and then the second thing, okay, we're going to do here is that uh, we're going to assume, okay, we're going to look at here, this here, delta beta, right? Delta beta is the other thing that um, is important, right? And delta beta itself is already very small, right? So if we use plane wave approximation, well, you can see delta beta here is, is very complicated. But if you really think about it, okay, it doesn't have to be this way. It's because delta beta itself is already very small, right? And then this term, beta omega, only have a small deviation from beta naught, right? So the small deviation times this smaller, small delta n is actually a smaller term, right? So it's a higher order term, okay? So it's very safe to use this plane wave approximation here, given the fact that delta n is very small. Right, so you can approximate delta beta omega, okay, to delta n, k knob is omega divided by c, right? And now you can further use approximation that because we say that the frequency, well, the, the frequency envelope is not very wide, right? Omega can be approximated omega knob times delta omega, which is, you know, the frequency difference between a uh, uh, different uh, frequency distance among the center, uh, so from the center, so delta n equal to omega naught plus delta omega, okay, c. There's no approximation in this step here, okay. And then you can say that delta omega is much, much smaller than omega naught, so that delta n times delta omega is a higher order term, right. So further ditch that term, okay, it would be delta n times omega naught divided by c, okay? So this term kind of simplify a lot of things and it actually makes sense is because the term that you ditch is just high order term, right? It's just high order term. So now let's see where we should write down the equation. Okay, we can get rid of here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to plug all those terms back in this equation, right? We approximate beta, we approximate delta beta, and then um, first thing you, you will notice is that beta not canceled, right? Beta not canceled because you do the Taylor expansion. So what you end up getting, what you end up getting is, uh, let's move the I back on this side, equal to, um, beta 1 times delta omega A delta omega Z, okay, plus 1 half beta 2 delta omega square A delta omega Z, okay, and then plus omega knob C delta N A delta omega Z, okay? And notice N here, delta N here is only a function of time, okay? It's only a function of time. And it's also it's very small, right? So um, at this step, it looks like we're almost ready to do a Fourier transform, right? And if you do Fourier transform, the Fourier transform will look like Okay, you know, whatever your term is, times E minus I delta omega T dt or d omega. Okay, minus infinity to infinity. Okay, this will be your uh, Fourier transform from frequency domain to time domain. And if you look at the first term, um, my integration on delta omega has nothing to do with z, right? So you can do the Fourier transform first and then do the differential of z, right? So the first term, very, very uh, obviously, give you, very, very obviously, give you i, a, 
zt, right? Sorry. Right, so this is the first term, very clear, okay? And then this term is also very clear, okay? Is that, okay, you, you treat this as a constant, and then you do this, um, you do this because you're integrating over delta omega, and then my delta n is actually a function of time, not a function of delta omega. So it's not in the play of your Fourier transform, okay? So this term is also very simple. That's omega naught divided by C delta n times a z t, okay, a z t, and this two term here, okay, this two term here is a little bit tricky. It's because you have delta omega here, and then you're integrating over delta omega, right? So it's not that straightforward, right? After after Fourier transform, it's not delta omega times a, right? Because after Fourier transform, delta omega should disappear. You already integrate, okay, so. Uh, what you can do here is that um, if you look at, I think it's page note 31, page 31, this is a very, um, this is a very uh, commonly used relationship, is that suppose, okay, suppose you do a differential of time, of E of time, and then if you look at it, if you express E of time in terms of Fourier transform, okay. Okay, now, and then you do this differential here, you move this differential in, what will happen is that, okay, this is, this is not a function of time, this is not a function of time, only this is a function of time. So you end up with minus I omega, okay. minus i omega e omega right so now if you look at it okay this now look very familiar right your omega times a function of omega and then do Fourier transform will give you the this your variables for the transform and do time differential delta t, right? And the same apply to this, okay? This is delta omega squared, then you would do twice of differential of t, okay? And then the details is in uh, page 31. Okay, so, um, so in effect, okay, this term will equal to i beta one, okay? Partial, partial t, a, z, t, right? This is this term. And this term will equal to um, minus two beta two partial a partial t square a z t. Okay. So it's a so now it become a very simple differential equation. And then the only thing that you kind of need to uh, readjust. Is delta n here, right? Because we know delta n is a function of intensity of light. Intensity of light is proportional to a, right? So what you can now plug in here is you can um, say delta n, okay, delta n is proportional, okay, you can say gamma is a function of gamma, and then a right it's proportional to the intensity of light and then there's a coefficient right and what the coefficient look like is given in note 31 okay there's uh, a way to derive that okay and um, let me let me actually simply write down here n2 divided by s effective times a. Okay, so intensity of light is the power of light divided by your uh, area, right? So this is your area, power of light, a, s, and n2. And you might wonder, okay, but 
the relationship between electrical field and intensity, there's a serious coefficient there, right? So, so where are they, okay? Uh, the way that you handle this is that you throw all those coefficients into F. You throw all those coefficients into F, right? And then you normalize A in, so that A square, A amplitude square is a power, okay? It's a power of light, and all other coefficients goes to F, right? And that's perfectly fine. Okay, so after this, what you will see is that you will see um, this term. Okay, this term. Okay, is I, well, is, okay. N2 as effective. And the definition here is okay. okay. The definition after this, okay, the the result will be a constant. Okay, that contain n two and s effective, and uh, a square a, right? A square a. Okay. And when you move i from the left hand side to the right hand side, okay, let's, let's write it down in a better way. Okay, you have i, okay, gamma a zt square a zt. Okay, and then minus i times minus i is plus. And then, boy, I think it's minus here. And then here is minus. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is the equation that we get from and gamma is. N to omega knob C as E effective. Omega divided by C is the K knob, right? It's the wave vector. Okay. So this is the uh, equation we get for um, this is the equation we get for the propagation of light in a fiber. Okay. And then you can see that it's a differential of Z and T. There's no frequency components here. Okay, so you just solve A. And this equation is very, very useful okay, when you solve a waveform propagate in a fiber. Uh, next uh, class, we will uh, give a very simple solution okay, to this equation. Okay. And that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.